Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Andy Costello, and I'm Head of Customer Solutions here at Kineo. Thank you for joining us today for this compliance training-focused webinar, where, with the help of our very special guest speakers, we aim to explore how the world of compliance training is evolving, some of the challenges you in our audience may well be facing, how we can deploy new thinking to change things up and, of course, drive greater effectiveness and results. And also how now, perhaps more than ever, it is vital to ensure that our organizations and our people are doing the right thing. I'm joined today by a panel who have in-depth experience, knowledge and know-how in this area. So I shall let them introduce you, themselves to you now. First up, Rory. Yeah, hi there. So I'm Account Director here at Kineo and I've been working on the compliance kind of briefing to the marketplace. Um, here at Kinia for a few months and I've been working with a fair few customers over the years on the subject of compliance. Thank you Rory. Next up, Tima, please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, lovely to be here today. Um, as the L&D manager at Ofcom, I've been working closely with Kinio on refreshing our mandatory compliance learning, but in a prior life I've been um, managing teams that have delivered compliance learning, um, both internally at KPMG for several years, as well as in industry for several learning consultancies. So thank you for having me today. You're all welcome. Fantastic for you to join us. And finally, Andreas. Hi there. So my name is Andreas Heraklius. I currently work at HSBC, but have a long career in financial services and digital learning, uh, much of which has included working with Kineo. So my current job involves working with the business and with other learning teams to make sure we build uh, great learning, which meets our design standards and, and is a good experience for our employees. Thank you so much, Andreas. Thank you all for joining us. Let's put all our minds to the test. Uh, just before we get into any discussion, as a reminder for those watching, please do add your questions into the Q&A tool as we've reserved the last 15 minutes or so at the end of the session for your questions. Um, we'd also love you to join the conversation. So let us know any questions you have. Uh, and my colleague Alex will be keeping an eye out for these so we can have some Q&A at the end or, or indeed throughout the, uh, the conversation as well. Um, we've got the chat function open today. So feel free to add your comments as we go. Um, and just make sure you select panel panelists and attendees if you'd like everyone to see your comment. Great, so to get us started then, I'm going to pass over to Rory Lawson, first of all, to set the scene and share some initial thinking around compliance as we see it currently. Rory. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, to help set the scene, so um, we've been doing a lot of research and through observations with working with our clients and through kind of the observations with the pandemic as well. Um, we, we wrote a, a market briefing. Um, and what I want to do is just take an extract of that briefing um, and just share a few kind of um, simple pointers as it were. Um, we're gonna start with Dave's story. Um, so we created a number of different personas and Dave's one of our personas. Um, this could be any learner though, that's going through their, their learning journey um, from a compliance point of view. Um, we start Dave's story um, with the fact that he's just um, been awarded a really great job. He's been successful in applying for this job and he's super excited about starting for this new company. Um, his first day goes really well. He's, he's you know, confirmed that he's made the right decision to join this organization and things are, are starting on the right foot for him. He receives his um, induction guide, his training guide, um, and he sees that there's compliance learning within and he gets that. He, he's joined a company that has got a good compliance culture. Um, he starts his training and then reality kicks in. The job starts to creep into his day-to-day -day work and he starts to take on the activities that he's been paid to do. Um, but all the while he's doing his training and his compliance work as well. Now, working with many clients, um, we've, we've heard this story time and time again, that there's just so much of this learning to do in the first kind of short spell of a new job coming into a new company. Um, but it can be hard to do it. Um, and sometimes it's not often made clear as to why they have to do the compliance training. Um, now, as time goes on, his day-to-day -day work really starts to kick in heavily um, and there's no time to remember everything that he's got to do um, and no time to remember everything that he's been taught through the learning as well. And this can end up in major frustration as they start to, uh, you know, Dave starts to lose the understanding of why he has to do some of this training. It's not been set within the context of the role 
whilst he's trying to remember everything about his new role itself as well. So it equates into what we see as an experience fail. Um, and this is a common story that we see across the delivery of compliance training, unfortunately. Uh, in a number of uh, organizations that we've worked with, we've, we've heard this story come, come to life and, and some of the pain points that uh, our, our learners feel uh, when we've developed their, their training. Now, before we can solve Dave's story, we have to kind of think about all the different personas that are involved within it. And that's what we want to kind of take you through, some of the key learnings and findings through talking to our clients about some of the challenges that organizations have around the compliance sphere. So if we look at Dave himself, um, now the persona here tells us that, you know, we're all busy people. We all have to we have our day job that we need to do. Um, and we kind of think about compliance training in a way that we, we just want it to be delivered to us in a way that's quick and easy to do. Um, we want it to be, to be relevant to, to our roles. We need it to be in context of what we're doing. Um, we need just-in-time support when we need it, so refresher uh, training, that type of thing. Um, but we want that learning to kind of be reflective of you know, what we're going to be doing as we move forward. So using personas like this and looking at the wider personas, we can start to understand the requirements for learning and the learning design pattern itself. So we built these personas out further. So we built it out to look at all the different people involved, um, involved in the problem statement for the design of compliance training. So we've got Dave, who we've just spoken to. So they just want things that are quick and easy to do uh, and relevant. We've got the likes of the head of learning design, the L&D owner. Um, now they're passionate about this. They want to make it right. Uh, they want to deliver this in just the right way for their learners and the, the organization. And they're prepared to work with the business and the policyholders to do that. Um, if we look at the, the head of business, and here we've got head of market, um, but ultimately they're responsible for their team, their people. Um, they, they want the right learning for their teams at the right time. Uh, they don't need their team to be away from the job too long because they have their responsibilities of serving customers or the business, as it were. And we also have um, our policy owners. Now, ultimately, they're accountable for the, the risk of the organization for their particular subject area, uh, and they want to get the, the right level of learning across to, to, to the learners themselves as well. Um, but what we found through our research and through our interviews is that there needs to be a balance between all of the different requirements that they have. So it's kind of trying to find and identify what they all have in common uh, to solve the problem. Um, the one thing that came out time and time again is defining the very notion of what is effective learning. What are the, the ingredients that make up for the right balance between all of these people? How do we meet all of their different needs? When quite often there's a contradiction uh, between what their wants are. Um, so for example, the policy owner wants to get the right level of content there. They may want to put more information in and, and build out a bigger learning suite as it were. But that can be in contradiction to the business who wants to take uh, care of their day-to-day -day, um, uh, kind of working. Uh, they want to serve the needs of their customers and they don't want people away from the job for too long. So it's trying to find the balance of getting the right level of learning across uh, without disrupting the business itself. From a, a learner's point of view, um, you know, they, they want the right context but they, they want to know why they have to do this learning in the first place. They, they need to have the right reason for it so that there's a clear understanding as to what the, the purpose is. So if we look at the balance, we have to also think about the, the wider kind of remit here for the organization as well. So that might be bringing in the role of the regulator. Now the regulator may be an external body or maybe an internal body, but they have a purpose as well. Um, now, through the research we did, we started to understand that there are now case studies where organizations have fallen foul to the, well, everybody's done the training, we've got the completion rates right, um, so therefore we're doing the right thing. And the regulators are now saying, well, actually, no, um, we need to see more um, with your compliance training uh, and your programs, your wider programs. We need to see that you're, you're learning from the experiences and you're building that into um, your, your compliance training programs. So this kind of brings a different kind of view to it. Um, I think we've moved from the old where 
just ticking the box and saying that completion rates are there is, is no longer good enough. Um, when we looked at um, this through the eyes of, say, a prosecutor, um, we found within this article here um, that there was a definition around this. Um, so prosecutors, in short, are looking um, for compliance programs being correctly disseminated across their audience um, and that is being understood by em uh, employees in practice uh, to actually implement this. And that's the type of thing that's really defining what truly effective is. Um, so we, we have to kind of listen to all these different views and work with all these different people uh, to make sure that we're thinking about the build and design of compliance in the right way. And these are the type of things that we want to consider today on the, on the call. It's just to kind of consider all of the different um, uh, viewpoints from a compliance point of view uh, to decide what makes for effective training. Now, some of the things that we started to, to bring from this are some of the things that our clients uh, and our stakeholders and all of those personas are looking at in terms of what makes for effective uh, design. So things that we're seeing um, and what quite regularly within our projects are the type of requirements that are coming through about making compliance-based learning much more personalised, um, perhaps using adaptive learning journeys to recognise current experience um, of employees and, and giving them the right level of content based on that experience. Perhaps that's an allowing for uh, concepts like testing out early within a programme. Um, we're also seeing much higher use of, say, storytelling, um, and that can be through using scenarios, um, uh, enabling people to make uh, judgment calls based on what they're seeing within a storyline. Um, obviously, people are looking at higher engagement. And that's always been a factor. So things like introducing media into the design at the right level uh, and in the appropriate way, um, maybe aiding the use of, say, scenario uh, telling uh, uh, through storytelling is, is a way to do that. Um, things like enhanced accessibility and usability, building a much more inclusive kind of design uh, piece as well. This, this is becoming a, a number one requirement uh, from our clients. Um, and it, for us, it, it's been built in. We, we have to see it that way. Um, but we're recognising from a content point of view on how we can adapt that and, and make it more inclusive. And obviously you have things like the assessment strategy, making sure that's right. But that assessment strategy doesn't just have to fall into the digital learning on, online. There are other forms of assessment in terms of how you evaluate success as well later uh, within the journey. So these are the type of things that we've been seeing. Um, we're open this up to the panel to discuss more and share their views uh, on this as well. Thank you, Rory. So lots of context setting there. Thanks very much indeed. Um, I like the overarching messaging of uh, of uh, effectiveness there. So the first question I'm going to ask the panel is probably um, one of the most common that we get in the industry, and that's about time and money. Um, the compliance-based learning can take a lot of time and can cost a lot of money, and we know that we don't always get the experience right for our people or for the organisations. So I just wanted to ask, what do the panel think about uh, compliance training and what that makes it effective um, when it comes to compliance, taking into consideration time, cost, and those two big drivers that are always a, a bit of a hurdle? Who wants to take that first? Yeah, I'm happy to start the conversation um, if, if that helps. So my experience is that we walk a tightrope, don't we? We're sharing sufficient content to enable colleagues to really know what's expected of them uh, and how to comply without overwhelming them. And so effectiveness for me is really about personalizing that experience as Rory has mentioned. Um, and, and only directing relevant content to people um, at a specific point in time. Um, I think there's, you need to have a harmonious union between process and learning because too often we assume that learning is what will drive the right behaviors and for people to understand policies and follow them. But actually there's so many other behavioral ways of encouraging and facilitating the right behaviors which for me is really what this is all about. It's not necessarily about what people have learned, but it's about are they doing the right things at the right time in their jobs? So for example, what I mean is we can, we can monitor and track 
consumption of learning, whether people seem to appreciate it. We can even start to see if it has somewhat an, of an impact on, on behaviors. But there are other, other simple things that you can do. For example, um, this is probably quite a, a crude one, but um, I, I'll never forget when I was thinking about designing something around health and safety at KPMG, one of my colleagues said to me, what's the best way of getting people to aim properly when they go to a public toilet? Is it a sign that says, you know, please make sure that you're neat and tidy? Or is it having a target somewhere for people to aim? You know, like a fly or a spider in a web or something like that. And it's, it's always stuck with me because I think there are so many behavioral ways, both within the learning and outside the learning around our processes that can help people follow the right behaviors and, um, you know, contribute towards a risk-free environment. It's not just about learning, I think. And that's where it's so hard to measure. It's not even necessarily a return on investment, but a return on experience, a return on behavior, because it's almost impossible some, in some instances to measure whether people, um, whether we've avoided an incident because people knew what to do. I really want to know the answer to that and what makes the best target, <laughs> but, but maybe we'll be digressing. Andrea, sticking with the theme of effectiveness, what, what would you like to add? Um, I think for me, like going back to your, your initial question, it's about having a really, really great relationship with your stakeholders. I think if everyone's working with a unified vision, you can make a really fantastic product. So thinking about the timepiece, it's engaging as early as possible. So you're not chasing a deadline. Um, at which point, you know, if, you, if you've only got six weeks to deliver a, a product, then you are probably more going to deliver a really nice looking click next type solution. But if you start early enough, um, you can go on the journey with, with your stakeholders, find out what are the actual behaviors you're looking to change, um, what are the current kind of measures to that, and then kind of work backwards from there. Um, for me, all of the things which Rory demonstrated on his slide earlier are things which I recognize from, um, from projects we're working on. I think adaptive um, journeys that are really effective. I think if you think about things like health and safety, those are the things where in your career you could do it, you know, infinite number of times. So it's how do you actually make that stick? Do you even need to make it stick at this point for some people? So if you give them an initial scenario rather than testing out, you know, provide a scenario where they have an opportunity to try out some ideas. Um, if they get that right, great, proceed to the end or just give them the, the kind of key summary topics. If they don't, then give them some, something a bit more in depth. Um, but it's really kind of thinking about what's going to resonate the most with the learner and, and not treating everything like a sheep dip process. Um, and that for me has been the big change I've seen in the kind of sort of 13 years I've been working in, in kind of digital learning. I like that. If they get it right, great. If they get it wrong, sometimes it's, it's more important that they get it wrong, isn't it? And then we've given them a, a safe place yeah. to fail. Yeah. Totally. Um, you mentioned stakeholders at the top of that as well, Andreas, and I think um, that's one, one thing that Rory covered as well, that managing them all is a balancing act um, uh, and can be not without its challenge. So how do we ensure that all the needs of the stakeholders are met? And is that even possible? Rory, perhaps you want to shine a bit more light into that? Yeah, so I think in the early part of the project, um, actually take it even further back to that, if working with some of the organizations that we have, we've seen uh, organizations take a, a complete step back and reflect about their whole curricula um, and building out business case to actually redesign their compliance offer, their compliance suite. And I think it's, it's at that moment where you start to bring together your stakeholders um, and start to generate a shared vision. Um, so by collaboration, by say L and D taking a, a seat at the table and bringing those people together to discuss the future of compliance within the organization. What is it truly that that organization wants to deliver and, and really building out a business case and, and building out the shared vision for what it could be um, can sets really the tone for what then happens. So everybody kind of goes forward um, to meet that vision uh, and it takes everybody really to, to do that, to, to really make it work. Um, otherwise, you end up with kind of fragmented offers, silos, everyone trying to do their own thing, different types of learning experiences, um, which can end up frustrating the learner because they're just seeing so many different standards thrown at them uh, through, through time. So I think that that's 
a critical one for me is, you know, from the very from the word go is have a shared vision going into the design of, 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 of your compliance programs. Thanks, Rory. Tima, did you want to add anything else on, on, on that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I was hoping Rory wasn't looking at me specifically when he was talking <laughs> about that, because no. we've learned that the hard way at Ofcom. Um, bringing the subject matter experts on the journey with us from the start um, would have been a pain point I could have avoided. Um, and so I've certainly learned that it is really important to have that shared vision before you start to think about engaging on, on the learning specifically. Um, but having brought them now on the journey, I think also that user research is so important in feeding into what that vision should be, because it's one thing as a learning expert to put forward what you see um, through your experience and what industry insights are telling you, but it's really the users from your organization who will tell you uh, what they think will work for them. And it's their behaviors that I think will ultimately drive those decisions that you make with your stakeholders. But I totally agree with Andreas and with Rory in that if the right stakeholders are not on board at the right time, you spend an awful lot of time just trying to get them on board before you can even start to think about, you know, smart learning and, and great design. Right. Absolutely. We've had a question come in, actually. Um, and the question is, I can't see the name. Apologies for that. But it's uh, the key question for me is alignment and clarity on what's the purpose for doing the learning. Be clear on the value. And of course, if we understand that, that we can get the stakeholders hopefully all on the same page as well. Yeah. And I think um, I can see that's a question from Steve. It's a, it's a good point there, Steve, because um, what I realized at Ofcom was that our perception of value differed amongst stakeholders. So, you know, for me, value was about a great learner experience and making sure that we can deliver that and people actually understand what's expected of them. And we, we encourage the right behaviors. For my subject matter experts, and I know I'm not alone in this one, um, value was in being able to convey enough content to learners. And that was it. So it, it really was about trying to get the, the mindset of throwing the kitchen sink at a learner with content is going to have the opposite effect to what often our subject matter experts think it will. You, there is such a thing as too much information. Yeah. Um, it can turn off learners. It doesn't drive for the, the kind of engagement that will drive the right behavior. So um, it's, it's really understanding what is value for me? What's value for my subject matter experts? What's value for my senior leaders? And what's value for my learners? I would Thanks. definitely second that. I think um, sometimes it's a question of why you're doing it, but then also how that drives how you're doing it. So mm. if I think back to my previous organization, we had to roll out something around conduct because um, it was impacting financial service organizations at the time. Um, and it meant we had to do something. Um, and it could have been a very kind of vanilla, you know, this is what other conduct values are, et cetera. But you, you can also use it as an opportunity to, you know, instill the right behaviors and get the buy-in and really sort of influence the culture. And I think um, those are the questions I, you know, sometimes you do it because you have to, but it, how you do it is kind of up to, up to you in the business. Okay. So how you do it and also perhaps how you design it, how we deliver it yeah. as yeah. professionals. So moving to that theme, we wanted to just cover as well, emerging trends, design principles, how we put it all together, exactly to your point address, I hope. And we're noticing some common themes emerging in the demand for, for compliance. Um, I suppose it's maturing. People are expecting more um, and, and better experiences rather than more experience. Let's, let's be clear. But what are the themes that you're seeing, the, the emerging trends and the design principles? What are you seeing? What are the implications for those of us uh, responsible for delivering uh, the learning? He wants to have a go at that. So I think um, and I'll, I'll start with just one, Andy. Um, so I think the, the, the hot topic has been around test outs. Um, for some sectors, that's probably an easier decision to, you know, to actually add that as a design requirement into the mix. Um, for other organisations that are highly regulated, it's quite a tough challenge. Um, I think it needs a lot of commitment from policy owners to understand the background behind the subject and the requirements they have for the business to be able to decide whether they can opt in on that. Um, so I think 
a, a lot of the projects we're working on at the moment were being asked that question. Um, and it, it takes a lot of buy-in for, for people to actually make that happen and to what level. Um, or it maybe sowing a seed of thought within the organization around perhaps we should be trying TESS out. This is the benefit it will bring. Um, it may take a bit of time for the organization to accept that's a good way of looking at it and how you still manage to get across the right level of information uh, to a learner. Um, but removing, say, some of the more common general subject matter from their learning pathway. Um, so there's a lot around the design of test outs that's been quite fascinating recently. Thanks, Rory. Andreas, I know you were going to come in there. I'll be better at actually um, asking the question more directly in the future. But yeah, did you want to you want to come in? Um, yeah, I think I think Rory's kind of captured it. I think for us, test out um, adaptive kind of journeys that are kind of one of the same in some ways. Um, I think the other side is how to use media in the right way as well. So again, you know, I've seen courses which have been predominantly video, but doesn't necessarily mean that's always going to resonate. I think sometimes you can throw too much at somebody and then they kind of go the other way and, and maybe kind of tune out. Um, and then I think thirdly is, you know, how you can articulate back to the business that return on investment. So if you can compare a a piece of learning one year to a previous year you know how much time have I given back to the organization by taking one of these approaches so if you are taking adaptive um, approach you know and you've you've reduced the, the average seat time down by 10 people across an organization which is thousands large you know that's a really good story to tell yeah good stuff thank you we had a question from Chris uh, on the panel uh, for the panel as well um, which kind of relates to what we're talking about, a good recipe for making the learning engaging. And uh, interestingly, would you champion traditional classroom training versus digital training, digital learning? Um, uh, Tima, did you want to come in here? You're on mute. I think team, Tima's screen's frozen a little bit. Maybe, uh, okay, uh, no maybe worries. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I think there's definitely still a place for classroom learning. I think it depends on the topic. I think it's that opportunity to kind of practice what you're you're kind of putting across from a knowledge perspective in, in the digital side of things. So if you are going to bring people together, be it on a virtual class or a face-to-face -face class, it's that opportunity to kind of collaborate, to give it a go and actually, as you said, tr uh, fail in a safe environment. Brilliant, thank you. Um, still waiting for Tim to come back. Just what we do, I, I want to know more a bit, just moving into the, sticking with the trends really and the drivers and the design principles how might they use, play out differently when it comes to compliance compared to um, for want of a better word the, the kind of sexier training topics compliance has obviously got a reputation as we know and has done for, for, for many years of of by dint of being mandatory something people have to do uh, and we've we'll, we'll cover that in a bit more detail as, later on um, why do we think that is why do we think that these the way we deliver it the way we design it or have done historically is different from those uh, cooler topics. Tima, welcome back. I think you're back with us now. Don't worry if you missed the the, uh, the first part of the question. So I, I, I know I was reading an article, Andy. Um, so Brandon Hall, um, they quoted a, a really good stat around this type of space. So if it was something like one third of um, uh, the organizations they asked um, stated that um, compliance was part of their talent strategy. Um, right. And that, that led to some of the finer detail in, in, in their summary, which was around um, a lot of the subjects like leadership or skills training or those type of topics um, had higher investment um, and a view on the way of approaching the design being more agile, more kind of uh, up to date in terms of some of the design thinking that would go on behind them um, and I think what, what we've kind of articulated through our uh, compliance briefing was you know really we should be vying in this space for compliance to have the same investment as those type of topics do um, and using the same type of design principles for them um, we should see compliance as a strategic advantage at the organizational level um, in terms of skills development because um, it it creates a culture that's, you know, it, it's that compliance culture piece where people are coming together under a shared vision. Um, and if, if 
compliance training is designed in the right way is engaging um, it should be no different to those type of other subjects that we see 100 percent. thank you and i think you raised a point previously rory and we cover it in our um in the articles on the website but you mentioned about accessibility and the importance of making it obviously available to all because if even one person is is non-compliant uh, that presents a huge amount of risks uh to an organization and to the people people who work within it mm. Tima, welcome back Sorry, yeah, the part of the world I live in. <laughs> no problem at My all. Internet drops. Sorry, I missed a few minutes. That's okay, no worries at all. We'll move on um, to the next theme I wanted to cover, which is about evolving perspectives on compliance-based learning and key factors such as cost effectiveness, delivery, and really importantly for uh, the work we're looking at now, post-delivery, making it uh, quantifiable and meaningful, proving that it works. So delivering compliance-based learning is complex. We all know that, but why is it? What are some of the challenges that you've experienced? Uh, experienced? Team, I'm gonna to come to you first. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, I think that uh, there are some instances with compliance learning, for example, with health and safety, where it's simpler to be able to measure behaviors and see the impact that learning and other factors can have on it through you know, things like the number of incidents or accidents or, um, or things that are reported to health and safety managers. Where we start to find it trickier to measure the success of, of learning in terms of behavior is, I guess you'll never know whether through provision of the right learning, you prevented an incident from taking place. So for example, the reason I say that is because one of my subject matter experts at Ofcom said to me, when we were trying to take them on this journey um, on refreshing our, our um, compliance learning, she said, I've never had an incident reported to me on anti-bribery and corruption since I've worked at Ofcom, which has been for a few years now. So that means the learning is working. The existing learning that we have is working, um, which, you know, for me, I, I really had to take a, a step back and, and uh, say, is it purely down to learning? Is that the reason why we haven't had any incidents? Oh, if it was. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I think that we have to be smarter about measurement of success. There are obviously um, things that our, our senior stakeholders will look to achieve um, by way of compliance standards. There are things that the learners will tell us they're experiencing, um, but it has to be a multifaceted approach, doesn't it, to, to seeing whether it's working or not from telling us what you think about the learning, telling us how much it's been useful to actually being able to see um, behaviours through incidents and, um, and other ways. So sometimes in some organisations simpler to measure than others. When um, I was previously in a professional services organisation, we could see it very, very easily through the number of transgressions in following um, compliance processes on the job. And you could see that when files were audited. So it was much easier to see whether people had followed policies and, and procedures or not. Um, at Ofcom, it's been a little bit trickier. And so we are trying to sit down with our um, experts and say, how can we come up with um, factors that we can more simply measure? Great stuff. Thank you, Tima. Andreas, I'm sure people are also really eager to hear what sort of challenges have you experienced and, and, and had to overcome when, when delivering compliance? Um, for us, with an organisation our size, it's, it's probably more logistical stuff in terms of translations and testing. So you can have a really great product and it does you know, everything, all the bells and whistles. But if it doesn't work in you know, a small branch in, in a certain part of the world, then you're, you're not going to get it over the line. So for us, the complexities are very much around getting to a point where we have a product which works um, in, in, in the UK. And then we go into that international testing uh, and try and resolve any kind of technical queries. And it's when you discover how, you know, you can't just assume that everyone has the same setup. You know, we, we've got um, parts of organization um, who, you know, not, not necessarily now, but previously may have had different versions of, um, of browsers and, and all that type of stuff can, can really have an impact on your timelines and, you know, and go live, et cetera. 
Thank you, Andreas. So yeah, with all these challenges in mind, we know that transformation, let's assume people do, that you know, they've come here because they know that there's a, a problem to be solved and they want to transform their compliance-based learning. We know that it won't happen overnight. It's a process that takes time. All those hurdles you've mentioned to get over, there's research, innovation, collaboration, experimentation, um, I think is something that is often overlooked because of time. But what design methodologies, and I might come to you first, Rory, if that's okay, um, what design methodologies can help uh help us overcome those those hurdles yeah so okay so i think where we've seen the industry go and a lot of people have been talking about things like human-centered design design thinking um but that there are other processes as well so this is just you know taking a practical view on building out a business case um where you start small you kind of move towards say just doing an mvp um test out a particular area of design um, test and learn type of mentality i've seen it within our client base um, making sure there's clear measurement points within what you're testing um, and then learning from that and building that into a wider proposition before you start to scale up to a kind of say even a global audience for example um, so i think it's, it's it's these type of methodologies that we're now starting to adapt and use um, because it gives us a much more evidence-based point of view in terms of the design uh, that we're carrying out. And I think if I loop back to something Tim said earlier, um, you look at the behavioral side of things and the behavioral sciences, if, if you are using those type of pr uh, principles within compliance and ethics training, um, the, the behavioral pieces are much harder to measure. So you have to have a very clear kind of starting point very um you have to kind of break down the outcomes into clear actions measurable actions that you want to to to, to view within part of the design um so that when you go to evidence it later you, you know you're looking in the right areas for that kind of behavior change mm. um so that's it's those type of methodologies that bring all of that together really so We'll get on to behavioural change in just, just a second. I just wanted to ask one more question to the panel, but you're right, Rory, that's obviously got to be the long-term gain here and the hardest thing perhaps to, to demonstrate. Um, but we recognise that change can benefit compliance-based learning. And if we do, why are stakeholders still nervous about it? And, and it can feel ironic given that organisations don't always measure the impact of their training well enough to know if it works in the first place. For too long it's been, as you said earlier on, Rory, the box ticking exercise. We've heard that so many times, haven't we? And where the standard was about engagement or completion rates or perhaps, a, you know, a, 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 if we're lucky, a bit of a quiz. So what process can we follow to convince business that compliance has to has to be that at that decision table as well that it should be taken as seriously as some of the uh, the arguably hotter topics that um, that often leadership want to focus and, and spend their investment on. What can we drive? Uh, what change can we drive to to see that? I think this has to focus around business change at the same time. Um, I think the process of design can actually expose issues and sometimes that can feel quite uncomfortable for for some parts of the business um, so it's about going back to that shared vision um, and, and setting up um, the pathway for for everybody to contribute and and drive towards so it's it's kind of like lean methodologies in terms of business change that are occurring there um, so it's quite quite a big thing to take hold of actually um, mm. quite a big challenge for a lot of organizations um, to invest that heavily into into the process Nima, coming to you as well that sort of uh, convincing that the organization that compliance is is critical um, how have you found it yeah so interestingly i think my really senior stakeholders know what they want the final outcome to be right like they know that they want everyone to understand policies and procedures and how to follow them and they follow them they don't really care well they didn't really care about the route to get there um, and so uh, a part of my role has been trying to educate and inform around the implications of good and bad learning design and practices because I think that up until now, there has been the assumption that if you, you know, they say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it think. Mm. Um, <laughs> it, it is the, the case where you can 
availability of content is never an issue with compliance learning. There's more than enough content sitting either documented somewhere in a policy on a portal in, in most organizations. Um, but it's about how do you really get people to engage with that content? And that's been the biggest journey I've had to take my stakeholders on. And uh, I think some of them will, truthfully, some of them are visionary enough to see it before we launch and before um, users will, will share their appreciation. Others, I think, will only really get well on their way on that journey when they start to see learners engage with the material, start to see the positive feedback and start to see people actually talk about compliance, not just do it as a one-off um, learning event. Um, and I should also just um, quickly say, Andy, that one of the biggest things, speaking of behavioral um, learning, one of the biggest things we've tried to change at Ofcom has been the concept of one-off learning. So we're trying to do quite a lot actually in one go with, with Kineo. We're, we're doing personalized training, adaptive learning, um, scenario-based learning that directs only relevant content. Um, but we also um, worked hard on the concept of nudges and phasing out and phasing learning through the year. Um, and that's another journey that I think my stakeholders weren't prepared to go on that I'm, I'm having to persuade them about is if you really want a compliance culture, it's not just built even through the most amazing learning that they take once a year. It has to be about something they're constantly aware of, reminded of, and is at the back of their minds. Learning is a process, not an event. But don't get Absolutely. Rory and I started on nudge theory and, and space <laughs> practice and all that stuff. We could be here for a whole different webinar. Andreas, um, well, thank you, though, team. Brilliant. Uh, Andreas, what about you? Uh, what have you experienced in, in this area? In terms, which bit specifically, sorry? Sorry, in, in about um, convincing your organisation that, 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 that compliance has to be taken so seriously. What, what's sort of making the penny drop? Um, I don't. I don't think we have that problem actually. I think you know, working in a bank, I think they, everybody sees why compliance is such a <laughs> point. such an important um, topic. I think um, to Rory's point, when you've got a vision, when you've got a, a business case which is saying sort of you know what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, um, and if you do have that kind of vision in mind, it's always kind of referring back to that as you go through the process because I think nobody ever sets out to make a bad piece of compliance learning. But I think what does happen maybe sometimes is, you know, you get stakeholders um, or a wider stakeholder group who has maybe bitters about leaving out certain bits or framing certain bits in a certain way without spelling out, you know, vis-a-vis -vis X number of it's making sure you provide that positive challenge throughout the process to make sure that you live up to the vision and you do honor to kind of the work which people have put into. You're breaking up slightly, Andres, but I'm gonna risk just sticking with you. Are you therefore seeing sort of longer term behavior change at, at HSBC as well, through all the things you're, that you're implementing? We may have lost Andres, that's okay. I'm yeah, gonna- Yeah, I mean, we're, we're focused on- No, you're okay. Have a go. Okay, now we're going to move on. Okay, last question, I think, for Sorry, this sort of I area. Think my, my connection's a bit dodgy, but I was going to say, um, okay. Give me a minute. <laughs> it's one of those things, isn't it? It's perfect timing. Um, Data-driven design, then, just before we go back to, to that area of behavioural change, it all feeds into the bigger picture, to be fair. So um, how do we avoid making the same mistake twice? Um, is it better to make a mistake once and learn from it? Data and analytics can prove invaluable insights into the direction that we we take our compliance based learning but how is data uh, informing what you do and and uh, data driven design in particular um we've lost andreas for now rory did you want to come in first with this before um we hand to tima yeah sure uh, i mean for, for me data is one of those big subjects in the marketplace now everybody's talking about it but for good reason i think um Data is definitely the future of how we can start to look at um, learning design. We can start to learn from data points that start to inform the very design decisions that we make day to day. Um, in terms of delivery, though, for compliance, I think this is probably one of the things that will start to really have a, um, 
a real impact on the marketplace um, mm. as, as data could start to inform what training is delivered when and how to employees it could have a very big deciding factor um, in you know pushing learning at the point of need um, so if I'm doing something and the system set up in the right way that recognizes that I'm outside of policy or something bad is going to happen because it's not just about policies about protecting lives as well and that type of thing it could start to then say perhaps push learning to me and uh, to help keep me safe or keep me on track that type of thing um, so data's got a big role to play as we move forward and it's a probably a growth area of the the marketplace that we you know that we can start to focus on thanks for as a teammate it's not just about policy what would you uh, what would you add here about data <laughs> <laughs> um, I think in some ways it um, is no bad thing that um, historically we haven't really used an evidence and data driven approach at Ofcom to see whether learning is, is working or not. Um, so I'm really excited to um, start to think more about using those data points, everything from how long people are spending. Um, so, you know, with the adaptive learning, um, are we seeing that people actually do need to go through the full course because they don't know enough to start with? Right. Or are they whizzing through because they actually know more than we assumed? So everything from that to where and when they consume it. Um, you know, previously we made the assumption that people wanted to use it uh, to learn on their mobiles. I've learned very quickly that actually people don't want to learn on their mobiles at all anymore. Mm. Um, so all of that will really inform, I think, going forward, what the second iteration of our, our program with Kinia will look like, because we'll know more about what people like, dislike, and when and where they consume it. Fantastic. Thank you, Tima. Um, I think we've lost Andreas for now, but we've overcome a lot of technical hitches across the call. So you never know, he may come back. And we've got about 15 minutes left. So um, I know we've had a few questions come in. I want to see if Alex, if you're able to join us for the last 15 and uh, maybe uh, consolidate some of those questions and, and see certainly between the three of us, if not with Andreas uh, coming back, we can answer some of them. Are you there, Alex? Hi Andy, yes, Hello. thank you. It looks like we've got Andreas back as well. And okay. thanks everyone for sticking with us. We are, despite a few technical changes, it's been a really great discussion. Um, so yeah, we have got some Q, uh, Q and A questions coming in. Um, so let me start with the first one. Um, this came in from Chris, I believe. So Fosway did a presentation at Learning Tech a few years ago. Andy, Roy, you might remember it. It was about segregating compliance, professional development and personal development and treating their design differently. What are the panel's thoughts on this? It goes back to one of the earlier points um, in my mind, which is about the the approach to the design um, being treated the same across the board for all subjects. So, you know, for its leadership uh, versus compliance training, that there's the same investment going into it, and that people are prepared to use the same methodologies for design, you know, agile design principles to work out the right way for design and delivery of, say, compliance. Um, so that in its own right is a way of kind of segmenting the design approach to that. Um, I think it's no, yeah I was just going to add yeah. there as well that it's it's you know compliance often feels like something people have to do and that immediately is a barrier um, and the word compliance you know is something actually that people choose people choose to comply um, so perhaps compliance is the wrong word and therefore perhaps it should be considered as a completely different part of people's development training critical to the organization and the learners that do it but uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, that answers the question. Oh. I think, yeah, um, if it's helpful, um, I think that there are some learning and behavioral learning insights and trends that uh, probably would apply across any learning. So, for example, um, the principle of personalization or adaptive learning is probably something almost every learner would appreciate now, regardless of what the subject matter might be. But when it comes to the very specific design of a course or a program, I do think that should be content led, not just with regards to rational learning, but, you know, hearts and minds. So where there's there are some areas, for example, 
at Ofcom, communication skills seems to be a passion. People love going on communication skills, learning courses. They love doing the kind of role plays and, and understanding how to interact and liaise with each other. Um, we don't have to think as carefully about how to win their hearts and minds over, whereas with compliance, it's very different. I think you have to think about um, en the engagement factor so much more because you're trying to win them over, not just in their heads, but in their hearts. So in that sense, I do think that you need to use some smart things around making sure people identify more with any characters you may have or with any very specific design elements you use so that you're appealing even subconsciously to more than just their heads. Wonderfully put, thank you. Thanks, Dima. Um, on a similar vein, and I should say, sorry, that last question was from Graham. Apologies, Graham. And um, so this one comes in from Greg and he says, should all compliance training follow the same format or are there benefits or risks to using different formats for different topics in a, within one organisation? E.g. you might do click through learning versus just in time, but could that end up confusing learners? This, I think this relates to um, something you was talking about earlier. I think maybe Tim was talking about it, but Andreas, I don't know if you want to come in, where learners can be confused with too many different things going on at once. And yet we want to uh, encourage a, a learning process over time where different interventions will actually have more of an impact. So there's a bit of a, maybe even sounds a bit of a contradiction there, but I'm not sure there is. Andreas, did you want to? Uh, hopefully you guys can hear me now. Yes, welcome so, back. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I think for me, it's choosing the right medium for the for the topic. So I think, um, as I said, if you choose the same approach for everything, it will kind of feel quite, um, you know, familiar and, and maybe over familiar and people will just kind of want to get over it. I think um, if you have something which can be best displayed as a um, as a really nice PDF, then, then do that. You know, it's about finding the, the way it's going to stick the most and also making sure you, as an organisation, you understand your calendar of events so you're not overloading people on a particular, um, you know, two-month or three-month period. So so messages have time to breathe um, and you get to make the, the change you want. And, and I think... Um, space learning, I can't remember who said that before, is, is definitely something I'd always be really keen to explore because I think it moves away from it being a, you know, a once and done thing to more of a campaign and, a, and that cultural element. Thanks, Andreas. Tima, did you want to come in to that as well? I mentioned the contradiction there. I didn't mean it really. <laughs> um, this was one of those aspects that I was really keen to um, run focus groups with at, at Ofcom. So we did, we asked um, our colleagues the question around, do you want to have learning um, at one point in the year or would you prefer to have it spaced out? And do you think that we should have a very similar design across all of the compliance learning or do you think it should vary? And overwhelmingly, our colleagues told us that they wanted spaced out through the year and that um, actually they didn't mind too much about um, the, the format of the learning. Um, but those who were slightly more opinion and, uh, opinionated about it actually did say that it can become a bit of a blur if all of the courses look very similar. So again, I think content should dictate um, the, the, the design that you use for a specific um, course. Um, exactly as Andrea said, sometimes it doesn't have to be e-learning. Sometimes it could be a video. Sometimes it could be an audio podcast type thing, a message from the heart from a compliance leader, for example. So I really think that it depends on the specific content and it depends on your organization's culture because I would say that that's a very different response than I would have received um, when I worked in professional services previously. There's a question, Alex, I think, is it from Stephen that relates exactly to, I think, what the team's been saying? Yeah, so Steve's asking, team, specifically, if you can talk a bit more about nudges. So, like Steve, we, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. We've explored everything from having um, challenges on Yammer. Yammer is our, our um, internal social platform that we use at Ofcom to um, what managers could do more just in time after a meeting or after a project, for example, in wash up. So we've done, we've, we're trying to look at everything from formal and informal learning through to our, our processes and how 
we engage with colleagues and with each other every day in, in our work. So um, it's tricky to get into specifics. Um, I'm happy uh, to have a follow-up conversation if you'd like, um, but it, it's varied across our, our courses and um, it's varied uh, by teams and groups and areas as well. There was a question that came up just as well from another Stephen about where they work. They release three to five compliance courses a quarter. Again, this is quite specific. And I think Rachel's point is difficult. It's impossible to say per organization what's right. But the question is, do you think it's better to release courses throughout the year rather than quarterly? And of course, you've kind of answered that. It depends on the culture of the organization as much as anything else. Right. Absolutely. And it's, it's right as well so a good strong governance structure around your compliance programs can help what one of my clients called the wild west once upon a time uh, where it was just a free-for-all in terms of getting compliance out there and it was overwhelming for end users without right. so you need some structure in terms of delivery to make sure that they're not feeling overwhelmed where in one calendar cycle they get 10 subjects dumped on their desk and they have to do it all in that that short space of time so we can start to pace things out and it's yeah it's often trying to find the balance of that equation what's right in one month to another and you know bearing in mind that at certain points in a year some companies have different calendar cycles but at some points the business is focused on what they're delivering or they're accounting for you know holiday seasons or seasonal kind of patterns as well so it's making sure yeah. you get your calendar cycle right with your learning is, is key i think it's one of the basic traits yeah thank you maybe one or two more alex yeah so i'd, I'd like to finish on um this question if we can to the to the panel and just ask you to perhaps talk about what you're most excited about um if that's the right word in terms of what's next for compliance learning within your organizations andreas would you like to go first Um, so for me, I think anything where we can incorporate the feedback of, of our learners. So um, we're undertaking a project at the moment where we, we were very much thinking we we're going to go down one route. And as a result of um, focus groups, uh, we're going a, a very different route in terms of the inspiration and the approach. And I think it's eye opening. Um, to, to take those voices on board, especially when it comes to compliance learning. So that's one thing. And then the other one is around um, making kind of really truly accessible and inclusive learning. So I think to your point, you know, historically, uh, accessible learning was a was a PDF which somebody would run through with a screen reader or somebody would need their manager to take them through. For us, we're really excited about the inroads we've made um, around, you know, raising our standards and being hopefully industry leading in, in terms of our approach to inclusion um, and learning. Brilliant. Thanks, Andreas. Tima. Ditto. Everything that <laughs> Andreas has said, um, I think it's been so exciting for us to work with Kineo because um, our learners will experience a, a completely different uh, type of learning than they have in, in the past. Um, for me, coming off a, a, a fairly low base, I think it will be um, thinking about how we use the data and the metrics that we get from um, our refreshed learning to drive a continuous improvement in the next iteration of, of the program. So exactly as Andrea said, um, using our feedback to improve it. Um, I think it's also about, um, when I think about future-proofing learning in general, um, I, I think of a pick and mix for some reason. I think learners will want to be able to choose the format in which they can see learning resources. So rather than, for example, necessarily having um, e-learning that, that, that consists of a variety of media, it might be that people, some might choose to watch something, some might choose to listen to something, some might choose to read something, and being able to give them a whole different variety of resources that cover similar content I think is possibly the way our learners will go because that's how we consume learning personally, isn't it? When I go on sometimes, depending on the subject matter, I want to see a how-to video, but sometimes I just want to read a quick, a quick guide. It was on your own time, doesn't it? I suppose a range of yeah. experiences as much as anything else. Rory, just, yeah. just lastly, um, what, what are we excited about well, seeing? 
Well, I've noticed there's a question there in the panel from Scott. Uh, so it's just talking to things like uh, in the flow of work, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, and that's, that is a really interesting subject area in its own right. Um, I think it's an opportunity uh, for this subject. Um, if we could um, recognize the technologies that are out there now that are integrating into the tools that we use day to day, even you know, like Zoom and uh, Teams and, and, and making sure that we could apply learning theory and learning design that breaks content up into smaller pieces and feeds it through that kind of channel. Um, almost making the LMS kind of invisible um, and using, like I say earlier, the data points to, to recognize when content should be served to the learner um, at the point mm. of need in those more bite-sized type pieces into the flow of work, making it much more accessible. But I think you have to define in the flow of work, you know, it's, it's about breaking down barriers to reaching that type of learning. Um, and bringing it nearer to the point of need. Um, and I think those type of technologies, those tools that we all use now day to day, uh, it's, it's another ground of opportunity. So, Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. It's uh, five o'clock, so I'm going to round things up now. But what a, a brilliant discussion. Really, really appreciate your expertise and your insights. Um, as mentioned at the top of the, the session, we've got uh, a lot of deep dive content and a, a whole series on compliance available on kineo.com, where you can dive into any of the themes that we've, we've talked about today in much more detail. And there were many more um, areas that we want to dis discuss. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to sort of um, feed that back. And, and uh, when we also... Um, uh, release the recordings of this. Um, as always, if you do have any more questions for the team here or you'd like help with your compliance learning challenges, however big or small they may be, do please get in touch. Um, we are always happy to talk as I hope we've demonstrated today. Um, so all that remains for me is to say thank you, Tima. Thank you, Andreas, for your time today. It's really, really appreciated. And to you, Rory, of course, it's been a great conversation. Thanks to everyone else that's joined us. Um, apologies if we didn't get all your questions um, answered, um, but thank you for bearing with us as well. Um, I've really enjoyed the session and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. All the best. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers, Bye. Guys.